<laughs> wow, from Brazil. So you're going to miss Zoom when the classes become normal, David? <laughs> yeah, you know, I am uh, coming. No, thank you, Alberto. And thank you for coming and, and sharing your work, your remarkable uh, work and thought um, with us as we begin this, uh, our, our Sunship exhibition in the uh, 17th uh, Venice Architecture Biennale. Um, and I'm gonna uh, briefly uh, introduce Alberto and then I'm gonna offer just a few thoughts. Um, but um, I, want to, uh, I want to start with, uh, with uh, some of the facts. Um, so Alberto uh, Perez Gomez was born in Mexico City in uh, 1949, where he studied architecture and practice. And he did uh, postgraduate uh, work at Cornell University and was awarded an MA and a PhD uh, by the University of Architecture and the Crisis of uh, Modern Science in 1983, won the Hitchcock Award in 1984. His uh, later books include Polyphilio or The Dark Forest Revisited, 1980, uh, 1992, Architectural Representation and the Perspective Hinge, co-authored with Louise Pelletier, and Built Upon Love, Architectural Longing After Ethics and Aesthetics in 2006. His most recent book, Attunement in uh, 2016, examines connections between phenomenology, recent enactment co cognitive science, and emerging language, seeking attunement in architecture and the urban environment, and examining the issue of architecture as atmosphere. He has also uh, recently published Timely Meditations, a collection of essays in two volumes. Alberto is also a co-editor of the seven volume series, Cora, Intervals in the Philosophy of Architecture, which has impacted all of us. This is a truly remarkable body of work. And taken together, it constitutes one of the seminal contributions to architecture in the 20th and now 21st centuries. It's a contribution to our understanding and imagination of life and space. In fact, to architecture as a life sustaining discipline. One that includes the nuanced fragilities in our shared stories and spaces. Now, as I said about two weeks ago, when we opened this uh, Sunship exhibition. I'm incredibly honored to be part of your team. Uh, and I hope uh, my little contribution today uh, is interesting to all of those that have joined us. And of course, I look forward to doing more and more, hopefully, um, hopefully having something perhaps uh, more um, informal to discuss questions of, uh, of, of this call to arms, as you say, that I think is, of course, incredibly important. And I feel really it's, of course, uh, mostly in the shoulders of the younger generations. You know, I don't want to, to say that I am abdicating. <laughs> But you know, I, we, we, I, I have done I have done quite a bit now, so it's it's for others to take uh, to to take the stuff. Anyhow, I'm going to share my screen and uh, and I'll get started. Okay, that should work. So let me, let me, good. So indeed, I will be telling you a little bit about, about this, uh, this recent book. Uh, some topics, you know, because it's of course impossible to do a summary of, uh, of a whole book in a lecture, but I hope, I hope you find it interesting. So despite um, its seductive uh, presence in the media that of course is very familiar to us, uh, the relevance of architecture in our global technological world remains unclear. 
at, at least the way, the way we normally understand it, with what we take it to be. Pursuing a tendency that can be dated back to the early 19th century, our discipline seeks justification in a logic associated either to the sciences and engineering or to the fine arts that today results in two major positions. And I'm simplifying here, but I think this is a, this is, it's, it's important to, to understand it in these terms. One that champions endless, often striking, yet mostly gratuitous formal innovation, as you see on the screen, fueled by the status of buildings as commodities. And the other that seeks obsessively technical sustainability while still presupposing the false assumptions of modern mentality, which is to say endless future-oriented development and perennial economic growth, even if under the kinder level of sustainability and optimization. Generally, contemporary architecture seems unable or unwilling to address the questions that drove it historically. And that's the one concern that you know, it has always moved me, you know, that, that there is a historical uh, narrative here that we, we can learn from. The need to address the crucial issues at the root of the human condition, its contribution to our very consciousness arising from biology, our spiritual aspirations that involve a quest for social justice, something different from making buildings that act as efficient stopgap solutions for practical problems often created by technology itself. Flaunting its supposedly unshakable nature as an autonomous act of creation or, or engineering, in both cases a purely instrumental act, it ignores the meanings present in the social environment that appear from the bottom up through the customs and habits of the cultures that inhabit our planet. Architecture remains mostly detached from the places in which it should be rooted and disconnected from both the ways of life of its inhabitants and their stories, failing to co contribute to their psychosomatic health. Indeed, over the past few years, computer software has made possible a pace of formal, more specifically geometric innovation that would have been totally unthinkable 30 years ago. Novelty seems almost inevitable, and it appears in our, on our computer screens every day as a seemingly unquestionable evidence of quality, purportedly embodied in the endless pictures of buildings, somewhat familiar, strange, and even weird, that are delivered, at least to all of us that are in the business of architecture, by multiple architecture and design newsletters. These creative effervescence may be exciting to some. Yet, the constituency of architects, students of architecture and users, becoming skeptical about the merit of so-called progress along those axes keeps growing. Approaching architecture as a technical problem for humanity's survival is necessary, but never sufficient. Technologies are famously blind to cultural values. In fact, that's one of its inherent problems, right? That, that, that in, techn in the technological world, almost anything, or I would say anything that becomes possible is actualized, which is very frightening. While on the other side of the spectrum, unfamiliar forms can appear cited anywhere in the world for reasons that have little to do with local cultures and autochthonous habits. So that assuming this is what constitutes real architectural value or that relevant meaning is automatically generated by such formal gains, to put it differently, has become harder to believe. While the contextualized global practices proliferate, obliterating smaller ones and becoming international corporations, cities keep growing exponentially and while providing shelter for over half of the world's population, are often experienced as alienating environments, regardless of their geographic location and their better or worse ecological footprint. 
The post-industrial city, despite its claim to have become a more hygienic environment from its traditional counterparts and therefore better for human life, is actually a source of enormous malaise, contributing to despair and even fanatic ideological radicalization for those in search of human purpose. Given the disregard with which contemporary humans treat the environment, subjecting nature and the biosphere to exploitation and urban contexts to an indifference fostered by our distracted mentality and digital gadgets, it is truly important to emphasize the crucial role of the physical environment, including, of course, cities and their architecture, as nothing less than a constitutive component of human consciousness. And I'm not speaking figuratively here. I'm going to try to make the point that this is literal. Mistakenly identifying consciousness with intellectual attention, we may think that we can effectively live in our screens, that we actually are our avatars in social media, that telecommunication is truly communication. Well, it isn't. Human communication is primarily oral, atmospheric, gestural, erotic, and embodied. Other modes of communication like writing and digital codes render information but can never fully reduce such communication. We may think that all that matters is what we can represent verbally or instrumentally. And yet, this is hardly the case. Representational consciousness is like the tip of an iceberg. We humans share far more than what distinguishes us from each other in the form of ideas. 80% of our consciousness when we are awake is pre-reflective. Not the same as saying that it's subconscious or unconscious. It's a different issue, pre-reflective. I will elaborate a little in a second. And consciousness is inactive, never passive. Even visual perception is not like the generation of a photographic image in the back of the retina. We see in high definition because our body, alive and acting in the world through motor and conceptual skills, enables us to contemplate such a world, solid and with hard edges, which otherwise would appear vague, full of holes and literally pixelated, like the ghostly inverted image that forms at the back of our eyes. Let me emphasize, contemporary cognitive science and neurobiology now recognize what had long been argued, albeit speculatively, by 20th century phenomenological philosophers, that the environment, in German specific word is Umwelt, is a constitutive part of animal and human consciousness. Just like each animal has its own environing world that emerges with their organic morphology and biology, the same is true for humans. The world of the fly and the world of the monkey, for example, have little in common, if anything at all. These worlds co-emerge for each organism as it acts out its own life seeking its particular modes of homeostasis, the biological equilibrium that allows the organism to prevail in life and which is its own modality of conscious meaning. In other words, our personal consciousness is not our brain. It is both embodied and embedded. The entire sensorium of our nervous system with our particular bodily morphology 
an orientation, the way we are bipedal, with a distinct front and back, left and right, up and down, with our frontal vision, very particular because it gives us the ability to contemplate the regular motions of the stars. And equally important, this consciousness of ours is always in place, so embodied and embedded in place, which inherently appears as an emotional quality. Despite the popular assumptions about the supposed interiority of consciousness, there is no human consciousness without place. Moods and emotions are effectively in the world and thus become a central concern in architecture and urban design. This also implies that from the start we find ourselves with others, that the social body is primary to the human condition, not secondary or optional. The internal and external components of consciousness are always interacting through bodily motility, meaning the movement that characterizes life itself. They constitute non-representational knowledge in the form of cultural habits, for example, long before things come to our attention. Thus, internal and external components condition each other, evolving as they deploy themselves in time along the path that is life and in a longer scope, evolution. The built environment, pervasive for the majority of our world's population, qualifies our thoughts and feelings and either contributes to our well-being, or as I would argue in the case of prevailing dysfunctional architectural and urbanistic practices, contributing to our collective psychopathologies. Thus, this recent book of mine became an attempt to consider alternatives to banal formalism and to purely instrumental sustainability in both architecture and urban design, while always recognizing the possibilities, conditions, and responsibilities inevitable for the architectural imagination operating in a globalized technological world. Despite the dangers of the imagination, when it is placed in the service of novelty or capitalist consumerism, or when it ignores the importance of place as the embodiment of primary pre-existing meanings, abdicating the personal imagination in favor of, say, rational consensus designed by committee or even algorithmic fabrication, for example, should not be an option. This is the case because ethical issues and poetic aspirations are always intertwined in our discipline. The human imagination is our fundamental organ for both compassion and beauty, to effectively engage and embody spiritual values in architecture. The issue is rather to properly understand the nature and origins of the imagination in narrative language and how it comes to fruition through material resistance. Modernity demands that architects seek new and appropriate formal and spatial frameworks for our changing lives, enabling a productive imagination to promise a better world for future dwelling. It is a mode of invention, yet I would add, to be significant, it must necessarily engage in a humble, cultured, and hermeneutically open attitude to given reality and the values of the cultures it serves. Despite the seeming solidity of a world that stays put when we are not looking, matter does not have ontological precedence over consciousness. Quantum mechanics in the, in the world of physics provide simple, if bewildering evidence of this fact. From this would follow that architectural meaning cannot simply arise from formal geometries imposed upon objects, 
from the top down, whether invented a priori by famous architects or generated by algorithmic software. Challenging assumptions that seem vindicated by historical practices going back to ancient Egyptian architecture, the understanding of this problem, particular to modernity, was a topic of my very first book, Architecture and the Crisis of Modern Science. Simply put, geometry, a fabrication of the human mind, was profoundly significant for architectural practices in pre-modern cultures that assumed that the world of experience was in perennial and unpredictable change. While the Euclidean forms and commensurate organization of buildings referenced the only modes of stability present to perception, epitomized by the geometry of the heavenly vault and the mathematically determined motions of the stars and the planets that could be visible to the naked eye. This resulted in an architecture mimetic of the cosmos, a condition prevalent in Western and non-Western cultures for millennia. Yet, as this geometry became instrumentalized as a result of the scientific revolution in, in Europe and its technical interests in the early 19th century, challenging its Euclidean, originally tactile axioms to enable the modes of production now common in the technological world, geometry can no longer be assumed to possess inherent meanings. Thus, identifying with other contemporary architects and writers that have been thinking about these issues recently, such as uh, Peter Sumter and Johanny Palasma, who believe that architectural meaning has more to do with the creation of appropriate atmospheres than with novel geometries or specific formal vocabularies. My recent work contributed, contributes to this position through an interdisciplinary approach, avoiding the misunderstanding of atmosphere as if it were a mere subjective orchestration of effects, but rather grasping its importance as the expression of moods in lived situations, occurring in habitual human action. The book explains how we might understand architecture through atmosphere as a communicative setting for human life, both cognitive and emotive, beyond the common yet failed definition of architecture as the created building that resulted from the misunderstandings inherent in 18th century objectivist aesthetics. Indeed, the concept of atmosphere has the advantage of immediately leading us to question objectivist aesthetics. The common confusion of aesthetic experience, necessarily situated, multi-sensory and emotional, being reduced to a distant, dispassionate aesthetic judgment. But designing architecture through atmospheres is far from a, single, a simple matter driven by a desire to overcome the old Cartesian dualities associated with objectivity and subjectivity. The concept of atmosphere is inherently ambivalent. And for this reason, its complexities for architecture are hard to grasp. And it can even become misleading. It is obvious, for example, that atmospheres and moods can be changed by users. If I light a few candles in a typical motel room, I can transform it, at least to some extent, into a temple of love. Arguably, atmosphere is perceived immediately and affects us not only intellectually, but also at a pre-reflective level, as I've been evoking this concept already, and I will elaborate in a second, as we act, as we go, you know, as we go on with our lives. For atmosphere to function as architectural meaning, enabling attunement, however, there must be some degree of fixity. And certainly forms, materials, and details play a very important role. It is therefore crucial to grasp the roots of the concept 
that is to say atmosphere in architectural history and its theories. And closer to us, the affinity of atmosphere with the concept of character in 18th century architectural theories. So as I embarked in this exploration, my first step was to trace the concern for properly attuned physical environments back to the historical origins of European architecture and its musical analogy, as it happens in Greco-Roman culture. You probably know I was particularly lucky because I could bring these things together with my own expertise in architectural, in the history of architectural theory. So this, this facilitated my work in this book. So I looked in these books again, you know, and I, I was looking, I was asking this new question as I was revising this whole tradition of architectural writings. So it is really, so I, I, I center on this question of the analogy between, between music and architecture. This analogy is, is, uh, is, is very present. Captured in Goethe's famous phrase, you probably have heard this, you know, very beautiful phrase. Uh, architecture is frozen music, said Goethe, right? That appears in all traditional architectural treatises. And even today, traditional really until the end of the 17th century, I will elaborate a little bit in a second. And even today, is the subject of sporadic scholarly papers, student projects, and even some competition briefs. The analogy of music to architecture, however, is commonly misunderstood, at least by architects. I don't know if musicians even care. Treated in formal terms, the reasoning being that since music deals with proportions and mathematics for its harmonic effects, producing beautiful sounds, this must be transposable in some way to architectural form, seeking the dimensional congruity of the parts of a building and its whole ruled by proportional ratios. This is fine, but superficial. In fact, a more careful study of Western theoretical texts reveals that the musical analogy always involved since its origin far more than such formal transpositions. The central issue was the design of human situations contributing to a good life. Ordered, of course, and this has political overtones, which we may not agree with, you know, but that's beyond the question of this lecture, right? But contributing to a good life that is compl complicated because uh, culture change, one that might be in harmony and balance, properly tempered, and thus healing for inherently distempered bodies. The spatial experience of architecture was therefore like that of music, the spatial experience of architecture, not, not, not this formal, you know, not as a formal object, was like that of music, capable of conveying cognitive, poetic moods through primary emotional sentience. Curiously, however, this attunement thought to be brought about by an atmosphere today is generally understood as a matter of subjectivity, really in total contrast with the objectivity of mathematics that governed both music, beautiful music and architecture and was also evoked in the traditional literature. This analogy of music and architecture for the sake of a good life is actually clear in the first text of architectural theory that has come down to us, the famous 10 books of Vitruvius. Architecture operates as a communicative setting for societies. For Vitruvius, its beauty is in fact its meaning as it contributes to human health and self-understanding. For this author, there is no concern for innovation or efficient design. If parts of buildings must be in proportional relations according to mathematical ratios, this is not a question of mere formal composition. The same numbers that were believed to govern the silent music of the heavenly motions, the regularity of planetary, solar, and lunar movements were brought down to earth through the projections of a solar clock to trace the cardinal orientations, north, south, east, west, and the rows of the winds, like in the middle of the slide that you have in front of you. The foundation of the harmonious and well-tempered city, the original foundation and necessary precondition for good architecture as well. 
and the setting of a good and healthy life. Harmony and temperance remain the core values in architectural theory throughout the Renaissance and well until the end of the Baroque period in 17th century Europe. In my book, I detail the persistence of the musical analogy in architectural theory in view of the cultural centrality of this experience and also in relation to the history of musical theories. An interesting example from the Renaissance is Palladio's Basilica in Vicenza. In the Quattro Libri, his treatise, Palladio's treatise, proportionality is taken for the first time in the history of Western architecture in three dimensions, to put it in a simple way, even though the idea of three dimensionality comes from Kant and Hegel, right? But in, in volume, coordinating the dimensions of rooms, their depth, length, and height, so that they convey a symphonic experience. In fact, following the trends in the Venetian theory of musical polyphony of its time, Palladio notates in this way his architectural ideas that appear there on the on the left of your slide, uh, on the left of the, of the screen, that appear as drawings of his work in his own book. There he proposes a perfectly harmonic basilica for Vicenza, one that nevertheless is not imposed on reality by demolishing a pre-existing medieval building. When one visits Vicenza, if one is not aware of the care taken by the architect, one may easily suppose that the building built is exactly the one drawn on the left. I certainly thought so when I first visited, having at the time not much more than cursory knowledge of Renaissance history. And yet, it is hardly so. Palladio took a lot of care not to raise the old buildings, which he perceived, perhaps intuitively we could say, because he didn't have our language, as culture embodied in frozen habits. He did not raise this, he treasured this to build his ideal project. The music is present to experience, but not imposed. It qualifies everyday life to make it more temperate. The harmonic form has a transformative effect on the complex and even contradictory functions that were housed in the buildings at the very center of that Renaissance city, the footprint on the right at the bottom, that included actually brothels, taverns, as well as courts of justice and city government and offices for city governance. The individual, therefore the citizen, participating in collective rituals and social institutions in such a resonant order, understood his or her purpose participating in a cosmic, politi political, a natural totality that transcended personal limits. Once the meaning of architecture as a cosmic analogy attainable through musical proportions was questioned in the late 17th and 18th centuries, eventually weakening the possibilities of employing geometry as a transcendental symbol in Western architecture, architects discovered the importance of narrative everyday language to preserve the communicative function of architecture, cultivating an expressive potential in view of human life, its values and institutions. While still emphasizing the importance of harmony as a goal, 18th century so-called character theory adopted a linguistic analogy to take the place of the older musical one. A good example from the last part of the European 18th century is a treatise by Nicolas Le Camus de Messiaire, the genius of architecture. Le Camus believed that harmony could be found in the analogy between proportions and human sensations, yet no longer through prescribed mathematical ratios. He thought appropriate dimensions would follow from the narrative description of exalted life and activities in place. His book presents the earliest ever qualitative description of architectural space, specifically the spaces for the design of an expressive private house. 
appropriate moods for the diverse rooms of the house are characterized through literary language and metaphor, made to appear by their respective dimensions, textures, colors, smells, in a crescendo reminiscent of erotic tension, becoming the theoretical model to design a dwelling and a model which he imagines can be extrapolated to all architecture. This development culminated in romantic philosophy, late 18th century, early 19th century writings, mostly German, in the formulation of Stimmung, the original German term for atmosphere that is used by Peter Sumter, for example, and more properly, attunement, understood as central to artistic expression. This is what the romantic philosophers uh, use the term to, to, to use the term Stimmung to, uh, to name that which is central to artistic expression. It is both the effect of art and the knowledge art provides. One regarded ever since as crucial for our cultural survival. This is because through Stimmung, the work of art allows us to recognize ourselves as complete and purposeful in order to abide in life. It's work that is life enhancing, right? This is the nature of the, the way that the romantic philosophers understood the purpose of art. This is the aim of excellent architecture. The etymological origins of the German term Stimmung are actually incredibly significant to grasp the potential of the concept in contemporary practice. And this is one of the things that I contributed in my, in my, in my little book. Indeed, it is crucial to observe that over and above its connotations in modern German, where it actually is usually, to, usually taken to mean internal or subjective mood. You know, the way we also understand mood as something internal, that's Shimon. If you are sad, you carry it within yourself. You know, even though it has this, this is the way that modern German uses it. Stimmung's roots included, if you look at the etymology of the word, how it's constructed, it comes from two roots, one that goes back to harmony and the other one that goes back to temperance. Remember, harmony and temperance, huh? the key musical terms of traditional architectural theories, as I have been discussing. Let me emphasize that the term, Stimmung, intentionally encompasses what appears, I'm sure still baffling to many of us, as a logical contradiction, that that which is external is also internal. Romantic philosophy recognized, like phenomenology and poets like Rainer Maria Rilke did a few years, a few decades later, that indeed, as Rilke put it, the inner is the outer. My joy or sadness are in fact the joy or sadness of the environment dwelling in the atmosphere. So, so think, you know, just think about that, you know, and imagine the, the incredible uh, absurdity of thinking that architecture could be dispassionate, could be a kind of writing that is abstract, self-contained, self-referential, purely stylistic, that it has nothing to do with anything out there. To understand the full scope of Stimmung for contemporary practice, it is particularly important to remember the precedence of embodied place over geometric space throughout the long history of our discipline. It, of course, has to do with consciousness, right? And I, I uh, dedicate a, a little chapter to this question in, 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 in the book. So here it becomes a paragraph. But yes, the issue of place is crucial. Architects never verbalize concepts of space, whether qualitative or geometrical, before the time of Le Camus. It's hard to believe, right? Architects never verbalized them. They were never, uh, you know, intellectual acts of cognition. Huh? They were experiential. They never verbalized. We, you know, we think that architecture is the art of space. We take it for granted that it's spatial, whatever, right? It's something very, it's a late, it's a, it's a late phenomenon. Start with Le Camus. In fact, it must be recalled that space as the so-called artistic material of architecture was never theorized 
in architectural writings, in fact, prior to the late 19th century, where it was done by, in fact, in, in the context of German art history, it was assumed that the sites of architecture were given with intersubjective cultural significance. Intersubjective, they were perceived by all, constituting a fundamental dimension of the meaning that buildings would eventually convey. Place and narratives have been interwoven throughout history, articulating their experienced and cognitive meanings. And the way in which architecture builds upon autochthonous meanings previously existing on site to generate its own frameworks for significant human actions is of course instructive for the generation of attuned architecture today. In other words, what characterizes places is first and foremost, the cultural narratives that are related to topography and place is primary in the manifestation of being and existing consciousness. While scientific space, starting with Galileo, may have become our placement in a universal technological world village, the autochthonous places exist and abide in hiding. They are present, and it is the task of good architecture to bring them back to collective awareness. A fundamental dimension of architectural atmospheres is their acknowledgement of place as a pre-existing condition in dialogue with any spatial proposition that the architect may bring to the table. Romantic Stimmung was aimed at the emotional heart, another specific word that appears in, romantic, in, the, in the writings of the, romantic, of the German Romantic philosophers, the emotional heart, which they called Gemüt, to differentiate it from Herz, which is the pump, you know, Herz is the heart. Gemüt is something else, is the real heart, <laughs> something like in between, like, you know, in between your stomach and where the heart actually is. Right? where emotion hits you, where you feel. This mode of understanding, uh, uh, where Stimmung affects you in Gemüt, is multisensory and therefore aesthetic, but aesthetic in the original Greek sense of the term. If you understand what the ancient Greeks understood by aesthetic perception, that's what it is. Defined as real knowledge, that is fundamentally sensory, that is primordially tactile, right? That tactility becomes is before vision, is become uh, sight, not as an inferior kind of intellectual knowledge, such as assumed by Baumgarten and followed up by Kant in 18th century. That is to say, the way that, that philosophical aesthetics gets understood and misunderstood even to our own days. The romantic position questioned the so-called common sense originating in 17th century Cartesian psychology. The existence of independent mechanistic senses, the hegemony of disembodied vision, and all sorts of associationist explanations of human meaning, as if meaning had to necessarily be a conceptual construction in the brain which is still unfortunately common today. For the romantics, perception is, on the contrary, meaningful always as it emerges at its inception. Meaning is already there. The primacy of synesthesia in perception intuited by romantic philosophy was further explained by the phenomenological philosophers of the 20th century, namely Husserl and Merleau-Ponty, and has been recently buttressed by neuroscience and so-called third generation cognitive theory. They call themselves inactive cognitive theoreticians. This is the way that architectural meanings are first given to our embodied consciousness, of which, as I already suggested, 80% is pre-reflective and in continuity with reflective attention and judgment. It follows that architecture should not be reduced to pictures or merely objective formal products that could be read dispassionately. Atmosphere is given as a whole and at the very moment of one's physical embodied 
and a multi-sensory encounter with a place. As one acts in life, framed by the architectural environment. A poetic image, the celebrated aesthetic effect of good architecture, is a second order meaning in continuity with the first. For an active cognitive theory and phenomenology, perception and consciousness are not passive, like digestion. They are always an action. So perception and consciousness themselves are already an action. This is important to grasp how architecture conveys its meanings, both in the emotional immediacy of presence and as a cognition or of order through the poetic image. Indeed, Edmund Husserl's phenomenological studies on the nature of temporality, today vindicated by neuroscience and biology, as explained in a recent book by Ivan Thompson there in the middle of your slide, on the intertwining of mind and life, show how the present is not merely a non-existent point between past and future, but how in our experience, in fact, exemplified by our perception of music, which would otherwise make no sense at all, the present has a thickness or dimension with an immediate past and future, an immediate history and project. The present, therefore, can be said to have a structural and permanent dimensionality. Grasping the true nature of human temporality is important since it is crucial to understand how architectural atmosphere can communicate both emotional and cognitive meanings. This is precisely what was denied by